A man was once talking to a professor. He was talking about someone that he knew, and he said to the professor, so-and-so tells me that he was one of your students. The professor replied, he may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. There's a lot of difference between attending lectures and being a student. Anybody can attend lectures, but you have to put forth effort. You have to study to be a student. And yes, the two words are related. They have the same root, S-T-U-D-Y and S-T-U-D-E-N-T. -E a student is one who studies. In the same way, it is possible to be a follower of Jesus without really being a disciple. It is possible to attend church service every week without being committed to the Lord. A disciple is literally a learner, but more fully, a disciple is a learner who follows. A disciple is not just a follower. In Luke chapter 9, we meet three people who wanted to serve Christ until they learned what service really involved. They wanted to be followers, but they didn't want to pay the price to truly be disciples. This is in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, actually. We'll call the first man the rash, impetuous disciple. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 58 says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Matthew's account tells us this man was a scribe. That's Matthew 8, verse 19. And so we first meet a scribe who wants to follow Jesus. Christ knew this man's heart. And since Jesus addressed the issue from the standpoint of advantage, it is reasonable to think that this man assumed he would gain some kind of worldly advantage by following Christ. Christ's fame, Christ's miracles were no doubt very appealing to this scribe, and certainly the man had been riveted and charmed by Christ's teaching, so it would seem very likely that this man expected to gain some kind of prominence by attaching himself to Jesus. William Kelly was an outstanding student of the Bible whose scholarship and spirituality were well known in Great Britain at the end of the 19th century. Kelly had once helped a young relative prepare for Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and in this way he came to the attention of the professors there. They urged him to take up work at the college so he could distinguish himself. When Kelly showed a complete lack of enthusiasm for their suggestion, they were perplexed and quite disappointed. One of them asked, But Mr. Kelly, aren't you interested in making a name for yourself in the world? In response, Kelly replied, Which world, gentlemen? So instead of feeding this man's desire for worldly acclaim, Christ proclaimed his own poverty. He said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but basically I have nothing. Christ was saying that the animals have their own places of abode, yet I have no place to lay my head. If you're looking for worldly advantage, Jesus says, you've come to the wrong place. That's not what serving Christ is about. Jesus is not saying literally that he had no place to lay his head. He's stating that he had no permanent residence. He's saying that his place of abode was dependent upon the hospitality of others. Here's a striking exhibition of the extremes which met in Jesus. Here is authority as exacting as that of an Eastern autocrat, a ruler who holds unlimited powers. But this unlimited power was combined with poverty as extreme as that of a beggar. The poverty is confessed without a blush, and the authority is asserted without an apology. In anyone other than the Son of God, these two extremes could not have met without the most ludicrous absurdity. Jesus is not trying to talk this man out of following him. Jesus just wants him to count the cost. Jesus wants the man to know what he's getting himself into. 
Jesus' reply is in accordance with his previous definition of discipleship in, in, discipleship in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This man volunteered, and there's nothing wrong with volunteering, but we must count the cost if we're going to commit to being a servant if we're going to commit to being a disciple of Christ, and apparently this man had not counted the cost. Impetuous promises to follow the Lord are not worth much when the realities of life set in. Those who are hasty and rash, those who are impulsive in coming to the Lord, will usually be just as hasty and rash about leaving him when times get tough. Being fit for the kingdom requires level-headed commitment. Commitment that recognizes and accepts the cost that will be involved. We'll call the second man the procrastinating or entangled disciple. Luke chapter 9, verses 59 and 60, we're told, Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Some maintain that this man's father was already dead. Some maintain that this father was ready to die. We don't really know. But one Bible scholar said, at the present day, an Oriental with his father sitting by his side has been known to say respecting his future projects, but I must first bury my father. This man was simply saying that he wanted to return home and wait until his father died. Then he would come back and follow Jesus. His request demonstrated that he, he felt his discipleship was something that he could pick up or lay down at will. The fifth command said, honor your father and mother. Honor has always been shown in how you treat the deceased. In Jewish culture, it was expected that the sons would take a leading role in the burial of their father. This man was using a noble reason to excuse himself from following the Lord. Using a pious, religious, noble reason to be disobedient is always a bad thing. You recall that in Matthew 15, verses 1 through 7, the Pharisees claimed that they dedicated their money to God so they wouldn't have to help their parents. This was an attempt to set aside the fifth command in the law of Moses, again, to honor your father and mother. Another example of using a pious reason to be disobedient was King Saul. His attempt, King Saul's attempt back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, where his plan was to sacrifice animals to the Lord, the very animals that the Lord had told him to destroy. And so Jesus' response to this man in Luke chapter 9 was, let the dead bury their own dead. That is, let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. The Jews often used the word dead to express indifference towards something or to show that something had no influence over them. They would say they were dead to the world or dead to the law, Paul says in Romans 7, or dead to sin, Romans 6 verse 11. People of the world are dead to spiritual things. Jesus, Jesus is saying, let those who have no interest in my work, those who are dead to my teachings, let them give their time and attention to the physical things. If you are going to be my disciple, you must put the spiritual above the physical. Since it was a religious, social, and family obligation to provide a decent funeral for one's father, Jesus' refusal to permit this is a striking example of the radical transfer of loyalty he demanded and that he still demands. This is noted in Luke 14, verses 25 through 27. We're told that large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
Jesus is saying that he has to come first. You can't come to Christ and still give other things first place in your life. A disciple must make a radical commitment. If we allow this thing to keep us from our duty, there will always be something else. Some sickness, some holiday, some other event. We're too busy. We're too young. We're too old. This project, that project. Being fit for the kingdom requires that our first duty be obedience, service to God. We'll call the third man the irresolute or the wavering disciple. In Luke chapter 9, verse 61, we read, Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, there's nothing wrong with a loving farewell unless it gets in the way of obedience to the Lord. This man was saying, allow me to set in order my affairs at home, then I'll serve the Lord. This man had a divided mind. He was willing to enter into a temptation, something that might keep him from following the Lord ultimately, but of course the people back home found out that, that he was planning to leave once they found this out they would likely beg him to reconsider. So he's creating an environment, he's creating a situation that would pull him away from that which he claims he desires to do, his commitment to the Lord. This man wanted to go back home. He wanted to say goodbye to his family. He was likely using this as an excuse to walk away, to give himself an out. And Jesus seemed to know that because Jesus seems to draw the conclusion for us he drew the conclusion that this man's heart was not in following him, that this man was looking back to the things of the world, that this man was looking back, and this looking back would prevent him from wholeheartedly following Christ. One who wants to obey God doesn't turn back to the world, for example, to seek advice and insight regarding what to do about following the Lord. You can guess what undevoted friends and family will say on those issues. Based on Jesus' response in verse 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Jesus addresses this man's issue. Jesus addresses this not as a case, interestingly enough, not as a case of going back, but as a case of looking back. This is likely a reference to Lot's wife in Genesis 19 verse 26. She disobeyed the, the Lord, looking back on her home in the city of Sodom, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. It is not an actual return to the world. It's the reluctance to break with the world. For example, the Israelites in the wilderness never returned to the land of Egypt, but their problem was that they never left Egypt in their hearts. Then focusing on the verse that we just read a few moments ago, verse 62, Jesus said, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man or no one having put his hand to the plow. This is a proverbial expression signifying the undertaking of any business. It was important for an ancient plowman to concentrate on the furrow or the trench that was before him. Notice that Jesus used the word, the singular word, hand. No man having put his hand to the plow. They would guide the light plow with their left hand while gold, goading the oxen with the right hand. And of course, looking away would result in a crooked trench. A significant point I believe Jesus is making in each of these cases is that in everything, there is a defining point. There is a crucial moment. And if that moment is missed, the thing most likely will never be done at all. Psychologists tell us that every time we have a good intention, every time we have a desire to do something good, if we do not act on that feeling at once, we are less likely to act on it at all. Each time we feel it in the future, the emotion becomes a substitute for the action. For example, you have a desire to send someone a sympathy letter or 
you have a desire to ask someone for a Bible study, but if you put it off, you'll be less likely to ever do it. Jesus is saying that we must act at once when our hearts are stirred to do the right thing. If these men in Luke chapter 9 could not respond now, if they could not put the gospel call over the issues of the world now, when Christ was standing in their presence, when his words were burning in their hearts, how would they ever be able to truly bear up under real trials and difficulties when they would inevitably come their way? Jesus explains the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, verses 20 through, 20, 20 through 22, and it relates to this issue. He said, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the world, the word rather, making it unfruitful. How many real Christians are not ready Christians? They're always willing to do something, but just not now. They really want to serve, but just not now. What if the work that is needed can only be done now? I need to say that I don't believe Jesus is telling all his disciples to forsake everything and become traveling evangelists. But the crucial question and the one he's asking here is, what if he did ask you? What if he did ask me to do this work? Suppose he were to lead your life or my life in such a direction in which your income would be lower, your prospects, humanly speaking, would be more uncertain, and your accustomed standard of living virtually non-existent. What if it were somehow clear that you are the person to fill this need? What would your response be? What would my response be? Would we be like Isaiah, who said, Here am I, Lord, send me? Or would we be like Moses? Oh, Lord, please send someone else. And how do we know that God is not trying to get us to forsake some of our worldly comforts and things? I believe God regularly tests the earnestness of our hearts by bringing us to this fork in the road where we are asked to give up things for his sake. When it becomes necessary to choose between two ways, which do we follow? God doesn't want people to impulsively decide to follow him. He wants people to count the cost and commit to serving him. God doesn't want people who have too many other things to do. God doesn't want people who just can't really decide if they're willing to serve him. God wants people who will count the cost, put him first, and commit themselves to his service, come what may. These are the ones who will be fit for the kingdom.